Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we, uh, I, I love these talks. We have a talk uh, by our uh, Spine Fellow, and he, uh, John Ogunlati, has just been a great one. He has, uh, he's just a pleasure for uh, everybody to work with, and that's an important thing. He's taken a lot of call, uh, never seen him uh, complain. He comes in, takes care of the patients, and does a, a wonderful job. Um, let me tell you a little bit about his lineage. He's the youngest of uh, three children. He grew up in Miami, um, uh, uh, unfortunately cursed by the dolphins. He didn't get to see them in their heyday uh, when I grew up uh, under Don Shula. Uh, having said that, he's still a diehard fan. He uh, went to undergraduate school at a Farquhar uh, uh, College uh, in, in Davie, Florida, and then followed uh, with uh, again, earning his uh, doctor of osteopathic medicine. Uh, at Nova Southeastern University, followed by his residency uh, at Riverside in California. Uh, he then came to us, uh, and uh, he has done, as I said, just a yeoman's job. Uh, uh, he works hard, he's strong, um, he's positive, uh, he's been uh, excellent to work with uh, in terms of the residents uh, and our faculty. And uh, in addition, he just landed a plum job at Washington University, St. Louis, uh, as a, uh, an assistant professor in spine, and that's what we like to see. We love when our uh, fellows and, and residents go into academics. That's what we're here for. So, John, thank you for doing such a, a wonderful job this year, and, um, and uh, tell us what you learned, and tell us about yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ellen Bolden, for that amazing introduction. And thank you all for being here and for the opportunity to present at the University of Washington's Neurosurgical Grand Rounds. Uh, it's quite the honor. Um, so I have no disclosures. And as Dr. Ellen Bolden said, uh, I did grow up in Miami, Florida. I was born and raised there. My parents came from Nigeria in about 1981. And I'm the youngest of three in my family. And my entire family is still in Florida, unfortunately, but uh, or fortunately. But um, I completed my bachelor's degree uh, not too far from Miami in Nova Southeastern University. I had a minor in chemistry and psychology. Um, and then I further went to get my um, degree, my medical degree uh, in osteopathic medicine at Nova Southeastern as well. Uh, from there, I then uh, moved all the way to the West Coast um, to Riverside County where I completed my residency training at uh, Riverside University Health Systems Medical Center. And um, after completing my residency, uh, I then uh, came furthest away on the continent of the U.S. from Miami to um, Seattle, where I've uh, enjoyed my fellowship thus far in uh, endoscopic, minimally invasive, and complex spine surgery here at the University of Washington. Um, as Dr. Uh, Ellen Bogan has mentioned, at the completion of my fellowship, I'll be uh, joining the team at um, Washington University in St. Louis uh, to lead their endoscopic and invasive surgery um, program. So in today's talk, I want to kind of go over some a uh, few things. Uh, briefly, we'll discuss the history of endoscopic spine surgery. Uh, I will try to explain the procedural names and why that's important, as well as, well as the major approaches um, and then from that, we'll discuss the benefit zone as well as uh, ways to overcome the learning curve that I've at least observed in my fellowship. So in order to kind of understand endoscopic spine surgery, we first need to understand how it came into existence and two major developments or innovations were necessary for that to happen. Uh, the first was of course a surgical component and then the second was the instrument, the endoscope. In 1805, a uh, German physician by the name of Philip Bozzini uh, developed a candle illuminated device uh, that he used to observe the human living body uh, through this very small tube. And through that, he would examine the urinary tract, the rectum, and the pharynx. And this would be the earliest concept of the endoscope that's found in the literature. Also in the 1800s and 1828, the first lumbar laminectomy was performed for traumatic disc by Dr. A.G. Smith. Furthermore, in uh, 
1895, we then had development of some diagnostic tools such as x-rays and the first forward viewing laparoscope um, by Dr. Kalk. He's known as a, a modern uh, day father of um, laparoscopy. In 1934, Mixter and Barr then are, they're considered the first disc surgeons. They published a series of successful discectomies um, and Unfortunately, they had very high uh, complications because some of their techniques were to do these transdural discectomy or um, resections. So as you can imagine, there were uh, high uh, amounts of infection and CSF leaks. But nonetheless, they advanced the field of spine surgery to now being able to access the disc space, albeit not necessarily the best pathway. In 1950, uh, a doctor in Japan, Dr. Masaki uh, Wanabe, uh, Watanabe, I said that wrong, uh, he developed the earliest, in this, uh, earliest arthroscopes, uh, and these were made with superior lenses that were handmade. So all this time, we had development of the surgery and the scope, and in 1967, uh, Dr. Yasser-Gill then performed the first lumbar microdiscectomy using the microscope. And he essentially uh, showed that in order to do this discectomy work, you need to have better visualization, which the microscope was then used to, you know, illustrate the disk space in a, in a better um, manner than uh, the blind eye, so to speak. By 1971, we got the development of a CT scan and shortly after 1977, but in between that time frame in 1973, we had a development of what was considered the first endoscopic procedure, which was the percutaneous nucleotomy. And I've termed this, um, I've coined the term of this uh, era to be the golden era because we had uh, the development of this new um, minimally invasive technique well, well before its time in 1973, but it was a non-visualized indirect spinal canal decompression surgery um, that was essentially limited by its use of small instruments that were needle-like that would be passed blindly into or under fluoroscopy into the disc space to do indirect decompression. As you can imagine, this was very limited in its um, uh, scope or even its uh, application. However, the inventor of this uh, went down in history as Parvis Cain in 1973. And later on in 1975, a physician by the name of Hijikata uh, further developed more, um, uh, he developed and published more uh, series of these uh, successful procedures and kind of cemented it as uh, a procedure that could be performed moving forward as a minimally invasive technique. In that time frame between 1973 and 1990, there was a lot of development of different tools trephines and different instruments that would be used to do these discectomies. Additionally, the modified arthroscope was then produced in 18, uh, sorry, 1983. And this would allow for a uh, better, more, you know, dorsal view of the intervertebral disc space. With that, in 1988, uh, Parvis Kamen was uh, the first to provide an actual endoscopic view of the herniated, herniated nucleus pulposus, and this was published in that time. And then in 1990, he then uh, defined the Cayman's Triangle, which everyone at this point is uh, very familiar with. For those who aren't, the Cayman's Triangle is um, a triangular safe zone that's bordered by the exceeding uh, nerve root anteriorly, the traversing nerve root medially, and the superior end plate of the lower vertebral body inferiorly. And uh, this was important for the development of endoscopic spine surgery because it allowed um, the surgeons to outgrow the technique of this percutaneous nucleotomy, as I said, was a very uh, limited procedure because of the small needle-like instruments. Also, this allowed for um, a larger working corridor where larger instruments could then be passed in closer proximity to the pathology and um, would allow for um, safe passage of these instruments without any harm to the exiting nerve root. Prior to this discovery um, uh, by Kamen, you know, the indications, like I said, were really just for posterior lateral and transformational endoscopic uh, techniques, and they were very limited. 
but um, this was then one of the reasons why the endoscopic discectomy remained at a low level of acceptance among spine surgeons in the 1980s and 90s. Moving forward in 1991, tubular access to the lumbar disc space was discovered or, or described by Lombard and Kaspar. And those two surgeons essentially um, harped on the endoscopic technique and now provided a tubular um, access, which you could pass large instruments to perform similar um, surgeries. With that being now discovered, there was an explosion of more newly invasive techniques uh, as surgeons were able to easily use larger instruments and the microscope to perform these surgeries that they were more familiar with than through the percutaneous route um, that was described in 1973. So moving forward, um, by the time we got to 1996, some surgeons were still very adamant about, you know, moving uh, the, the use and the futility of the uh, utility of uh, uh, endoscopic sp uh, spine surgery, and they developed their frownoscopy as well as the lumbar nerve root decompression through an annulectomy, essentially more um, of the same removing disc and still an indirect decompression. In 1997, we then had the development of multi-channel endoscopes, which allowed for larger working channels. And then in 1997 as well, um, we then had the first published discectomy through this working channel endoscope for far lateral discectomy um, by Dr. K Kevin Foley and Smith. They use essentially a, a 25 degree rod lens through a 16 millimeter diameter tube. Though the learning curve was steep, um, it fell out of favor for the majority of neurosurgeons, but orthopedic spine surgeons quickly embraced these techniques because of their great familiarity with the arthroscope and doing joint surgery. So they tended to continue pushing this, um, this not necessarily uh, today's modern endoscopic techniques, but this hybrid between percutaneous and endoscopic um, uh, uh, through the working endoscopic channel scopes um, type of procedures. And then in 2003, uh, the metrics tubular system was then uh, invented by uh, Kevin Foley again. And this would be important because from that point moving forward, there was now the competing um, further minimally invasive techniques through the tubular metric system that a lot of surgeons were very familiar with and can continue to um, uh, use their knowledge of open anatomy to a smaller tube because uh, the anatomy was pretty similar through the tubular dissections compared to the other divergent group or the group of endoscopic spine surgeons who were now still working in um, these uh, smaller uh, minimally invasive access with very little uh, visualization of the anatomy. And despite the advancements seen in that post came in triangle era, the wide acceptance of endoscopic spine surgery, like I said, was very delayed because there was also a very limited amount of instruments that could be used to do these surgeries. Additionally, the optical systems were very archaic and uh, compared to the microscopes that were being used at the time did not provide a very good um, uh, visualization of the anatomy. And then uh, additionally, like I said, these MIS techniques had been technically, uh, had, had more technical advantages because of the large amount of instruments that could be used similar to doing an open procedure with a smaller uh, incision and smaller exposure. So there were three major steps which transferred spinal endoscopic surgery into the disruptive technology it was. The first was something as easy as applying the arthroscopic principle, which is um, dissection underwater to the technique. And that didn't happen until 2003. And additionally, this allowed for, you know, better visualization of the anatomy. It, uh, the surgeon saw a significant reduction in their intraoperative and postoperative bleeding. In addition, the infection rates went down significantly. The range of the approaches now that were able to be done with this new uh, adaptation of endoscopic spine surgery um, went from being just a pure transferaminal and a posterior lateral uh, approach to now an interlaminar approach because they now also had 
these larger on jurors, high speed drills and other instruments that could be used. And that was later developed, as you can see in the timeline in around the 2010 area, uh, uh, 2010 timeframe. So all that is to say that, you know, endoscopic spine surgery has been around for about 50 years has been well, well, um, in the, it's been, has been a long time in the making to get to where it is now. And I think now we're starting to see uh, why, the, uh, why acceptance of the technique, uh, more interest going into technique. And that's also been demonstrated with the number of increased publications as demonstrated by the 2020 article from the European Spine Journal. And it essentially showed that, you know, China and South Korea has been the most productive in the uh, production of these um, uh, publications. And they also, for the longest, they've been the leaders in pushing forward endoscopic spine surgery. And in many cases, it's their standard of care for decompression surgery. In uh, 2018, uh, Ledwanski and his colleagues then performed a survey of many surgeons around the world. And that survey also demonstrated the similar findings that the United States was kind of behind the curve for the practice of endoscopic spine surgery. In the top left panel, you can see that for the transfemoral approach, the green highlights the, the surgeons who um, use this transfemoral approach amongst the surgeons who, are, uh, who return the survey. And the top right is the interlaminar approach. Even smaller percent of surgeons use that approach in the America compared to Asia and um, Europe. And then the bottom two, uh, the left, bottom left is uh, describing uh, full endoscopic spine surgery, uh, so anterior and posterior approaches. And then in the uh, bottom uh, right is describing uh, the percentage of surgeons who do what's called uh, over the top, or in other words, just bilateral decompression from unilateral incision. And um, I would like to believe that since 2018, these numbers have gotten, um, have changed significantly, but uh, that's still to be seen uh, with hopefully another publication soon. So in 2020, a group of 27 endoscopic spine surgeons led an effort to publish the nomenclature for endoscopic spine surgery procedures. And this was important because the previous term percutaneous uh, that was used for the percutaneous nucleotomy really implied um, that these were purely image guided procedures with no direct visualization, which in today's standard of endoscopic spine surgery, that's incorrect because it provides a very up close and uh, direct visualization of the treated, the treated pathology. So now the term full endoscopic is used to describe procedures that are um, done within these working channel endoscopes. And uh, this distinguishes them from the other kind of endoscopic procedures that are considered endoscopic assisted, which you can see in this chart on the far right. Those are um, operations where the tools are then passed in different trajectories that are separate from the endoscope. So by developing this um, naming system, it allowed for better comparison among procedures which would aid in research and would also then create an international standardized description for the procedures being formed, allowing physicians and uh, you know, academics to discuss these procedures uh, in a more uniform manner. So now that we've kind of understood the history and the nomenclature, we can talk about the actual approaches. And there's two major approaches that I think once you've uh, learned these approaches and you understand the approaches, uh, you can then build from there and essentially have access to the entire spine. Um, so the basic concept that applies to both pr procedures, whether they be transforaminal or interlaminar, um, is first you have to identify the pathology that you're going to treat on the preoperative imaging. You know, you're going to have good patient selection, examine your patients, and make sure that, you know, the pathology that you see on the imaging is truly the one that needs to be treated. Once you've identified the pathology, you can then choose a surgical approach, whether it's best suited transforaminally or interlaminar. We can go into a little more details about some of the pathology that are better for each uh, different procedure. And then essentially in the operating room, you want to hit the target area for that approach. And we'll go over what the target area is for each of those two different approaches. Then once you've identified, once you've hit the target area, you're going to move to identify your principal anatomical landmark. 
And this essentially is a landmark that allows you to complete the surgery and the goal of surgery while maintaining um, good orientation so that you don't get lost in spine. Um, and before I move forward, uh, I also wanted to highlight the image on the right is kind of a comparison that we already know in traditional surgery, we do just as I described, there's interoperative imaging to localize to the level of the disc space that we're uh, treating or the level of the pathology. We do some form of palpation, whether it be with metrics tubes or with our actual fingers in surgery to fill the actual lamina or the spinous process. And then we have direct visualization once we've exposed. That same concept of palpation to visualization exists within endoscopic spine surgery. However, it's on a more precise and um, finite level. You start with your uh, intraoperative imaging. You're going to hit the target area and palpate that target area. And then once you dilate it over that target area, you're going to then get direct visualization through the endoscope. So understanding the approaches, the first we'll talk about is interlaminar approach, probably the one that I um, got better at the quickest. Um, the interlaminar endoscopic approach is well suited for spinal pathology that's confined to the bony spinal canal within the medial walls and, and even into the mid pedicle portion of the uh, neural foramen. These include subarticular disc herniations, specifically at L5S1, it's great for that as well because the interlaminar space is much wider. And um, also lateral recess stenosis and synovial cyst, which um, uh, are a great indication for interlaminar approaches. You can also use the interlaminar approach to do unilateral laminotomy for bilateral decompression. In other words, if you have a patient with you know, neurogenic claudication, you can do a full laminectomy, or sorry, a, a unilateral laminotomy and get the same effective decompression as doing a full laminectomy, but without the same amount of bony destruction. And in addition to that, the interlaminar technique, you can, uh, it allows for a better rostral caudal decompression of that um, uh, index level. So um, first we'll talk about that target area for the interlaminar approach as demonstrated on this diagram by this red star. The interlaminar, uh, the inferior medial edge of the rostral index level is the actual uh, target area. And to consistently get there, you wanna start with an AP, and in this image, we're gonna move from left to right. We'll start with an AP end plate view of the superior end plate of that caudal spinal segment. So in this case, we're looking at L3, L4, and the arrows, the green arrows, demonstrate the end plate view of the superior end plate of um, L4. So from there, you'll add zero to five versus 10 to 15 degrees. So zero to five would be in the upper lumbar segments and 10 to 15 degrees would be in the lumbar, lower lumbar segments. And uh, you will add rostral tilt. And this will allow you to move that interspinous process space to be centered over the disc space as in, demonstrated in image B and C. So once you have the um, interspinous process space the, or that interlaminar um, space centered directly over the disc space as in C, you've now determined your trajectory to that target area. And that is going to be essentially um, your first image that you will use to localize your incision. You then bring in your first dilator, and this is uh, in the very far left picture of the um, image. You can see that there's that uh, first dilator, almost like a jam sheet needle, but it's on the patient's skin, and we're marking that inferior medial edge of the rostral index level, so the L3 inferior medial edge of the lamina. There we'll make our incision, usually about half a centimeter in size, and then um, you would also wanna make sure you incise the fascia. And once you have the first um, dilator uh, going directly in that same trajectory, you're gonna use essentially a small sweeping motion with both hands until you feel the inferior medial edge of the rostral um, index level. Sort of like when you're doing with metrics too, with the first dilator, but the motions are a lot smaller because you're hitting that small target. Once you've palpated bone, you can slop, slowly slide that um, first dilator tube off the edge of the lamina, confirm that you're correct directly on that edge of the lamina. And then you would take a lateral x-ray 
to confirm that you have the right disk level, the disk space. Once you've confirmed the level and you have your uh, this first um, uh, dilator directly on that inframedial edge of the lamina, you're gonna then do your serial dilation is usually a total of three um, dilator tubes. And then the final working channel or um, sometimes called the tubular retractor and then you get an AP x-ray to confirm that it's exactly where you want it to be. And to kind of demonstrate uh, that, I'll go over a um, uh, case. Um, but before, I, before we get to that, the inferior principal, sorry, the um, principal anatomical landmark for the interlaminar space is the yellow ligament uh, attachment to the rostral lamina. And we'll, I'll discuss that a little bit further, but uh, the, that attachment allows you to complete for this procedure, complete the entire procedure without losing orientation of where you are. Uh, in this uh, patient, in this case, this patient has a synovial cyst, which I will see. So if you can see my mouse, uh, there's a synovial cyst here in the right. Um, and the patient also has severe um, central canal stenosis. The patient presented with um, neurogenic claudication symptoms. And so this patient went for a right-sided uh, unilateral um, laminotomy for bottle decompression. And uh, this is that case. So just for your orientation, the right of your screen is the patient's um, caudal, I mean, uh, uh, rostral, and then caudal is to the left. Uh, medial is directly at the top of the screen. And this is identifying the target area that we palpated with our first dilator. Now we're going to visualize that dilator, I'm mean, sorry, that uh, target area much better. And I like to use the Bovi, sometimes I use the um, uh, radio frequency probe. After that, you want to expose that edge so that you know exactly where you are. Uh, you have a landmark to return to and uh, using the blunt uh, end of that micro punch. Now we're performing our lam laminotomy and we're drilling this lamina. This patient had very thick lamina. I'm not sure if it's visible on the imaging, but we wanna to get to the point where we can see the attachment of the yellow ligament to that um, uh, rostral lamina. So here you can now see the yellow ligament comes into view and we're using this uh, 4.5 diamond burr to actually drill along that attachment to perform our laminotomy. And in doing so, we don't necessarily disrupt the entire lamina. We really just undercut the surface of the lamina until we find the end of that attachment of the yellow ligament. This is the caudal lamina surface. So in this case, L5, and we're going to widen that so you can see we can get a better rostral caudal extent. And here we're now widening the um, lateral recess, unmoving the lateral recess. Now we can take this large kerosene and then do our resection of the yellow ligament. And this move is quite important to be careful not to just pull quickly because then you may pull dura and, and create a durotomy, though it's very rare. So here you can now see the um, ipsilateral recess, lateral recess decompression, part of the synovial cyst there is being removed. And then with the radial frequency probe, uh, we'll come in and shrink down uh, some of this bulging disc there, as well as get hemostasis. As you can see, there's a little bit of bleeding, uh, not much, probably a few, um, less than one or two cc's. And then we're just cleaning out some of this lateral recess and separating uh, soft tissue from the dura. Again, we're shrinking that disc protrusion with the radio frequency probe. So as you can see, the traversing nerve root is uh, directly in front of you. The exiting nerve root is further um, cephalad and already exited. We're now going to go contralateral and that requires us to uh, dissect off this uh, yellow ligament so that we can better visualize the contralateral um, side. And we can, from there, we can then do our contralateral decompression. Uh, this patient had mostly central stenosis 
that um, and and not a lot of lateral recess um, stenosis, but we still were able to go um, contralateral and decompress that side. So like I said here, we're just stripping off that uh, yellow ligament. And then with the kerosene, we'll come and uh, take the rest of it down. And at the end of that contralateral decompression, um, you'll see at the end of this video, we had wide decompression of the fecal sac, and it was completely decompressed from uh, lateral recess to lateral recess. So moving on to talk about the transferaminal approaches. Uh, these are some of the different uh, transferaminal procedures that can be done. Um, and then, you know, sometimes you can also do what's called trans-SAP approaches, where if the foramen, the foramen is completely collapsed and you don't have a lot of room for that nerve root, you can essentially resect the top part of the SAP to create room and do your decompression. Um, the target area for these um, approaches Oh, excuse me. Uh, the target for these approaches uh, is the medial aspect of the uh, foramen annular window. In other words, the medial aspect of the Cayman's triangle. And to um, get there consistently, first start by in letter A, image A, you can see you first start by making three vertical lines from the midline. These lines are measured at eight, 10, and 12 centimeters off the midline, confirmed by your CT scan, I mean, your um, C arm uh, x ray. And then from there, you want to identify the index uh, disc space level that you're gonna be doing your surgery on. And that's also done in the AP view as indicated by um, the image B. And once you've done that, you'll have something similar to this picture here in the far right in the image C. So you can see there's a line going across the level of the disc space. And then there's three lines that are marking the distances eight uh, 10 and 12 centimeters from midline. In larger patients, you're likely going to be at the um, uh, incision line of eight centimeter, I mean, uh, 12 centimeters, and I'll explain that in a little bit. But um, at the bottom, you can see you're now going to have a uh, rostral caudal uh, trajectory that you aim, your goal is to have the um, trajectory connect the rostral aspect or the tip of the SAP. Um, to the medial aspect or your target area um, of the annular window. And in doing so, you've now created this trajectory. You draw your line as an uh, image D, and then based on your patient size and body habitus, you would then choose the best line. A way to confirm the best entry distance, whether it be eight, 10, or 12, is to take a uh, lateral X-ray and where you place your initial um, jam sheet needle on that line, you want to make sure that it's in the vicinity of this um, uh, imaginary line that connects the tips of the uh, spinous processes, the top of the spinous processes, as in the picture H. Once you've found the best distance for your starting point, you then are going to pass your jam sheety uh, over. Um, uh, in the same trajectory as you've marked out with the um, AP x-ray, and this is done under um, AP fluoroscopy. Essentially, your goal is to, by the time you hit the um, actual uh, lateral portion of the SAP, um, the superior articulating facet, you want to then guide it anteriorly uh, or um, ventrally to the SAP and slide it inferiorly into the disc space. And in, in your uh, AP fluoroscopy, you want to make sure that you don't pass this um, uh, medial, medial, medial pedicle line, uh, which is this guy here. So uh, once you've gotten your jam sheet in this trajectory, you then check on a lateral x-ray. And then you also want to confirm in that lateral x-ray that you're not past this posterior vertebral body line. Um, once you've done that, you can then pass the rest of your dilators. 
if you're doing a trans SAP approach in between each dot layer, there's different specific reamer to help remove some of that um, SAP, essentially doing a foraminal plasty. So once you uh, hit your target area, you're then going to be looking for your principal anatomical landmark, which is going to be your superior medial surface of the caudal pedicle. Um, and to demonstrate that there's a, a case. So this was a patient that had thoracic myelopathy and had a very large calcified thoracic disc uh, eccentric to the left side. This patient had multiple thoracic discs, uh, which were uh, treated during the surgery, but for the purposes of this presentation, we'll only discuss the largest one. Um, and this kind of goes to that benefit curve, which we'll discuss a little bit later, but we were able to do a trans SAP approach to get to um, this thoracic disc and do a decompression. And this is a CT just further demonstrating the calcifications and the amount of stenosis. So in this uh, image, the patient is, uh, her, the patient's head is to the left of your screen. So that would be rostral caudal is to the right of your screen. Directly in front of you is medial at the top of the screen. You can see this is the target area, which is the medial aspect of the um, Cayman's triangle. Uh, the probe is now finding and dissecting out the um, rest of the SAP that we reamed through. And this is now identifying the uh, principal anatomical landmark, which is the superior medial surface of the caudal pedicle. So moving just a little bit, Cephalad, you can see that we're dissecting out the rest of the SAP that we did not ream. And we want to be able to confirm uh, how far much more or how much more of this we need to remove. So we're doing a foraminoplasty with this 3.5 diamond burr. Now we're going immediately to further remove some of this um, medial SAP and get into the lateral recess. This is a 25-degree uh, angled scope, so it's a little bit um, disorienting at first. But here you can see we're now dissecting the disc thorough interface with this being the calcified disc here, and this being the dura up above here being pushed up by this calcified disc. With this procedure and this approach, we can directly drill that calcified disc down and um, create essentially a cavity for us to pull um, this, you know, herniated calcified fragment into to, to uh, decompress the fecal sac and the spinal cord. So here you can see we're now able to reach up and underneath the um, dura and pull away that uh, disc herniation. Just a little bit more cephalad at the inferior end plate of the rostral uh, level, there's some more calcified herniated disc. And so we're drilling down that part of the disc and, and even some of the end plate. And now we can remove the remaining part of that disc herniation that's uh, still causing some compression on the spinal cord and the thoracic spine. And at the end of the procedure, you can see um, that the spinal cord has rebounded and it's no longer being tinted up by this herniated disc, which you'll see uh, at the end of this, of this last piece that, that was uh, needed to be removed. So here you can see that the dura has been well decompressed and is no longer being tinted up. So what's the point of it? You know, what's the point of doing endoscopic spine surgery? Um, as full endoscopic spine surgery uh, represents the evolution of minimally invasive surgical access to the spinal pathology, we've seen just as with minimally invasive spine surgery that these procedures allow us to minimize incision and damage to the underlying soft tissue it decreases operative blood loss. It reduces the post-operative pain and narcotic reliance. 
This also allows for early ambulation and shorter hospital stays and gives patients the opportunity to return to work earlier. This also helps reduce the hospitalization uh, length of stay. And uh, there's more recently a uh, prospective multi-center study uh, that has demonstrated uh, in over 7,000 uh, patients, a 16-fold reduction in uh, infection of surgical site infection compared to traditional spine surgery, which is unheard of. So um, these are all effects of this procedure that allows you know for surgeons to provide you know the most minimally invasive care to their patients, and also it reduces the economic burden on patients and society by returning patients to work quickly as well as uh, having them go back to normal activities and uh, thus minimizes the amount of need for revision surgeries. So this paper here kind of outlined these findings, but uh, took a couple graphs from that paper, which kind of, and this one, it, it shows the surgical invasiveness compared to the complexity. So down here on the bottom of the, uh, on the uh, x-axis, you can see uh, complexity of each procedure, discectomies being technically the, the least technically complex, and fusion procedures the more technically complex. And then we charted that on the invasiveness and complications. And as described or as illustrated in this last case, the thoracic decompression, that procedure normally would be a very involved, very invasive procedure. However, in the thoracic um, decompression procedure, you can see that we were somewhere in this area of benefit zone because the procedure was less invasive. Um, the patient ended up did end up getting a fusion for other reasons, but um, it was also um, uh, least amount of destruction to the uh, um, surrounding tissues and, and bony anatomy. Um, this allows for us to also then um, look at specific um, uh, percentage rates in comparison to traditional surgery. So again, in that same uh, publication, they looked at the reoperation rates and reherniation rates. And though um, the reherniation rates were uh, higher in endoscopic, uh, the endoscopic trial uh, for that procedure, the overall complication rate was lower, uh, as well as withdrawal charge and infection. And this was compared to the cohort from the SPORT trial. And in this last picture, you can see they also added the Swedish spinal stenosis study and essentially did a comparison of reherniation and as well as dural tears and found that um, this was lower in comparison to those studies. So at the end of it all, the question is, is, you know, why is learning curve so steep? And in my experience, these are the things that I found to be uh, the the explanation of why we have such a steep learning curve in endoscopic spine surgery. The first being the handling of the working channel uh, in the scopes. Um, initially, uh, you have to learn the different ways to hold each scope. For the transframmal approach, there's a different grip. And for the intralaminar approach, there's a different grip of the scope. And the scopes are also different as well. Additionally, normally when you do surgery, if you're um, right hand dominant, your left hand is usually left to just hold suction and do retraction. But in endoscopic spine surgery, your left hand is used to guide the working channel or the tubular retractor, and it's constantly moving and putting, um, you know, uh, contact pressure on the underlying bony anatomy. So you're constantly working with both hands in concert with one another so that you can move your scope and get different views. The other thing is that you have to learn to work in planes as opposed to go directly to where you want. And you have to then learn how to work off axis and on axis. The reach for each could be completely different depending on the pathology you're trying to reach. So the surgical progression from x-ray to the endoscopic view as we described earlier uh, is part of the learning curve. And um, for a lot of people, it's hard to consistently get to that uh, target area um, so that they can actually get the endoscopic view. There's a lack of 3D perception as well as um, there's a very, very, in the United States, there's a, there's a paucity of formalized training. Um, for example, my program, we had absolutely zero endoscopic spine surgeons, and that is the same for many um, programs around the nation. 
And then understanding the, anat uh, the anatomy for endoscopic spinal surgery, as well as uh, maintaining the orientation. Um, a lot of people have found this to be quite disorienting because you are limited to a very small um, amount of anatomical landmarks for you to actually rely upon and, and have orientation with. In addition, you can rotate your camera 360. And if you're not paying attention to which way you rotate it, you, it's easy to get lost. And then there's a high capital equipment cost. Uh, endoscopic tower is pretty pricey and not every institution or hospital could afford it or and not every residency program has that uh, capability to, um, to have it. And not having an endoscopic tower means that um, the residents or fellows are not gonna be able to get their hands on it to learn these other parts of the procedure early on in their training. So the question then becomes, how do we flatten the learning curve? And you know, some of the things that's come out to help flatten the learning curve are the Endoscopic Spine Academy, which essentially is a um, industry sponsored academy for people interested in learning endoscopic spine surgery from residents all the way up until attendings. And they're, uh, you know, essentially allowed to go to these cadaver courses and learn how to use endoscope and learn the history of endoscopic spine surgery. Uh, in 2020, Dr. Hofstetter and a uh, uh, group of other amazing endoscopic spine surgeons put together the Atlas of Full Endoscopic Spine Surgery, which I think has been probably my biggest uh, aid in learning endoscopic spine surgery, um, not just from the con concepts, but also being able to have the literature um, that when I get to the OR, it's going to be exactly as I uh, read the night before. Additionally, there's a global growth in research and international collaboration as we've seen in some of the um, publications that we, I presented earlier. And then uh, the growing number of endoscopic spine fellowships uh, presents you know, an opportunity for more exp or early exposure for residents and more fellows to be created, which will eventually lead to more endoscopic spine fellowships and more exposure for residents. So it's a, um, you know, um, uh, self-fulfilling rotating rotundum door i can't think of the term i'm looking for but uh with that what we're also seeing is that there is an increased patient demand and this means that because more patients are demanding these surgeries there's going to be uh pressure on the industry to provide surgeons who can do them and because of that the flatten the learning curve will have to be flattened because more people will publish more will invent more and will continue to uh, advance the the field of endoscopic spine surgery. With that, I just wanted to give my closing remarks and say thank you um, to uh, everyone here at the University of Washington. I would be remiss if I did not express my heartfelt appreciation for um, and gratitude to Dr. Ellen Bogan, to Dr. Young, to Dr. Hofsetter, Dr. Chestnut, Dr. Wiseman, Dr. Bono, and Dr. Shaker. Um, they all have been very instrumented, uh, instrumental in my uh, advancement in this um, fellowship. Uh, I've been given uh, invaluable advice and mentorship, and for that, I'm grateful. I um, also want to say thank you to the supporting staff who's uh, been here for all the fellows, myself included, during this transition period. And then thank you to the residents. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with all of you, if not the majority of you, and uh, I really appreciate you guys allowing me to be a part of your dream team because uh, you guys really are a rock star dream team. Um, and then last but not least, uh, it's been quite the honor for me to be uh, able to work alongside this year's class of outstanding fellows, um, including Dr. Ben Grannon, Dr. Charles Miller, and Dr. Q Tran. Um, I do wish you all the best in your future career and endeavors, and I know you guys will uh, continue to crush it wherever you go. These are my references, and now we'll be able to answer any questions. John, great job. Thank you.